Hello there, welcome back. I'm Martin, and today on Daddy Roll to One, I'm going to be talking about how I create NPCs, uh, how I do foreshadowing in my games, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about a kind of a scary Halloween themed game that I ran for my daughter and her group. It was a couple of years ago, but it was right around this time of year. Today is October 30th of 2023, and I thought you guys might enjoy sort of a, a spooky scenario that you can actually run yourself. So it's uh, it's available for free, actually, the one that I found that I adapted into my game. So as a reminder, I've been running this adventure for this group at, at the time. Now they've finished with it now. Um, but this was about two years ago. It was about a year into our, into our game of playing when I um, got to this particular part that I'm going to be talking about. So just jumping in to talk about NPCs. So I use um, ideas that Professor Dungeon Master on his Dungeon Craft channel on YouTube came up with. And I'm going to link that in the notes below. But he talks about NPCs kind of being like of, of three different kinds. There's contacts, there's sages, and there's villains. And uh, I, I use that. I use that in my game, but kind of added a, a couple tweaks on it. Um, I also use NPCs for exposition sometimes. So rather than, you know, again, just droning on and on about stuff or giving them like a big thing to read, I'll use the NPC interactions and conversations to um, to uh, provide the exposition to the players. I also use them uh, obviously for services. So you see in my book here, I had a bunch of characters like this and um, all of these people right here, these were all potential hirelings that they could have hired. And so sometimes the NPC is just there to be, um, you know, again, like used as a hireling or a retainer by the player characters. And then lastly, one of the things that I always try to do in my groups um, is to try to have a unique NPC for each player in the game so that they have someone that they sort of feel like is, is their specific NPC that they interact with and talk to. And that kind of helps them uh, develop their own characters along the way. And I'm going to talk about how I do that in some examples here. OK, so just jumping in uh, again, I'm, I'm going through the keep on the borderlands and there's a map in here um, that talks about like what's in the key. Now, these are the caves. Uh, and then the actual keep, there was um, not a great map, but there was a map that talks about like there's different, all the different things that are available in the keep as far as all these different buildings here. And it's like there's a guild hall and there's, um, you know, tavern and all that kind of stuff. So the PC, the NPCs that my players met at the, the first at the beginning was at the tavern. So uh, again, I'm using the tavern uh, called the Greased Goat that was in Professor Dungeon Master's Dungeon Craft channel on his Caves of Carnage campaign. It's changed quite a bit from his, but that's where I started. So you see here the Greased Goat Tavern. And um, to me, the tavern in a D&D game is kind of the equivalent of a 16th century or, or 17th century coffee house, right? So it's the internet of the day. This is where people from all over, um, you know, different walks of life are going to come. They're going to meet. They're going to share ideas. They're going to share news. They're going to share rumors and that kind of thing. So I, I kind of looked at the... Um, at the the tavern in this particular game as that concept like again it's the internet it's where the player characters are going to learn things and talk to people and understand like what's going on so the first npc that they met in the tavern was this particular guy so i got these pictures all off of pinterest and you know you, uh, i do have a pinterest account i guess i'll link it in the in my um show notes and then you can see like some of these uh, different uh images if you want to use them for your game so professor dungeon master called him gustav gobbleguy i just thought that name was hilarious so i used it as well and what was really great about this guy is that when the player characters first interacted with him they just come from the caves they've been captured by goblins they barely escape with their lives they're low on supplies they're just low on, on everything and they're dirty and they're hungry and they're wounded and they came into the this tavern and um this particular guy talked to him and so i just had him just be like super gregarious and over the top he's this big just happy jolly guy and they loved him right at, right away and one of the things that my daughter's character did was that she kind of over tipped him when they got a round of drinks and um he i had him react very positively to that and so he's sort of become like their friendly face in the crowd whenever i can tell that they're being uh, getting a little anxious about something going on i make sure that they interact with him and that helps them kind of calm down 
you know, one of the things about having this guy have uh, kind of that big, gregarious, over-the-top personality was that it made it super easy for the characters to recognize him. So as soon as I start kind of talking in his voice, I didn't even have to say it's Gustav. They just knew right away that it was him and he was greeting greeting them. And so that brings me to another point about NPCs. So um, I try to do voices in my daughter's game because she kind of wanted me to, even though she teased me about it a lot. Um, but you know, I, I was trying to do that cause I've never really done it before. And I was kind of trying to challenge myself as a DM to see if I could do it. So I don't do it for all of them, but one of the things that I try to have for each NPC is I divide them up into three and I try to have each one of them have a particular, like uh, I, that's three quirks, right? So it's a speech quirk, a physical quirk, and then like an other quirk. And so the speech quirk could be like they talk very fast or they talk very slow or they talk in a whisper or they're always kind of gravelly or they always talk like they're upset or or they're excited, like something like that that sets their voice apart and everybody's a little bit different. And so even if I can't affect an accent correctly, I can at least do that to my own voice and it helps them to kind of get a sense of who that character is. Then a Physical quirk could be something like the types of clothing that they wear. It's very opulent and rich clothing. It's poor clothing. It's rags. It's the same thing every time. They notice that like the character never changes clothes um, or, you know, their clothes get progressively dirty, like whatever it is. And it doesn't have to be clothes. It could be, um, you know, other adornment that they have. It could be tattoos or scars or things like that. But something physical that immediately sets this character apart. It might even be like the color of their eyes or the color of their hair or uh, just the way that the hair is styled. Right. And then lastly, a quirk uh, can be something that I, I like to do which is like, um, you know, a, a, like a physical motion that I can do to help them kind of understand. So it could be, you know, one of the characters would, um, it was this one actually right here, uh, this one, I, I said she was constantly like brushing the hair out of her face. And then another quirk could be, um, you know, maybe they cough all the time when they talk. And that could also be part of their speech quirk too. But like, again, something that I can do that's super easy, but that helps to identify that character right away as far as when I am role playing them. And so uh, that's something that I did uh, very quickly with this guy. And a lot of times I do it on the fly, but when I have time and I plan ahead, I write it in my notes as to, so I remember like how to act for each one of these people. So I remember like these two people were husband and wife. And anytime anybody asked him a question, she would answer and then he would roll his eyes. And so it would kind of let you know like how they, how they interacted together, but it was a quick, a quick way for the characters to kind of get to know them. These were potential hirelings. I was talking talking about that a second ago. So these are all different characters that they could meet at the tavern. A couple other people that they met here, now we're getting into some more different types of characters, were Scabs. This is a character, again, from Professional Dungeon Master's channel. Um, he's part of the criminal underworld, and I had him be... Um, uh, you know, he's like a rogue or a thief type. And I had him kind of um, gravitate toward one of the thief characters. There's, there was there's one player that plays a thief, but she's changed characters. So she had one thief called Alex or Alexandra. And then she decided to change her character to be a, a new thief called Augustus. And she kind of retired her old character. Alex by having Alex run uh, into uh, the caves of chaos and, you know, supposedly never to be seen again. OK, so that's scabs. But then there's also. Um, curfew Murphy. So I got this idea from, uh, and I'm going to put the link in my show notes, but I got this idea. Somebody talked about, um, you know, how to kind of do some fun, different things with the keep on the borderlands. And this is from like a blog post or it was a message board or something. And this person uh, created this gang called the chicken hawk gang. And it was run by this woman named curfew Murphy. It's like a young girl actually. And I just really liked that idea because I kind of made her the same age as my daughter and her friends at the time. So this idea that, that there was this young girl that was reading a leading, a sort of a criminal organization. Um, they're pickpockets. They're really low level. Um, it's, you know, maybe a little breaking and entering, but nothing major. And so the main criminals uh, kind of ignore them. This guy works for the main thieves guild. And so these are introductions to the criminal underworld of the keep, but it's also letting the players know that there is um, criminal activity in this uh, in this keep and that it's probably maybe a little more than the guards and things can handle because you've got two different organizations essentially. So when I was talking about how I like to have uh, different NPCs kind of unique for each PC, sometimes they share them. But in this particular case, so I had this character, Curfew Murphy, sort of approach the original thief character, which again, what was named Alexandra, same player. And 
uh, talked to her a little bit about how she could join, you know, the gang if she wanted. Um, but, you know, she didn't have to. But also keep on the lookout for the official Thieves Guild because they will be very unhappy if they find another thief operating the town that hasn't checked in with them and that kind of thing. And so um, this person became sort of connected to that character. But then what happened was that player decided to, you know, again, retire her original character and start a new one for whatever reason. She just didn't like that original character, uh, just to give you a side of how the teenage mind kind of works. So, or the tween mind at this time, um, this player had based her original character on a friend of hers at school and she'd had a falling out with that friend and they are no longer friends. And so she didn't want to play that character anymore um, because it kind of reminded her of this, this, you know, failed friendship for lack of a better term. So she decided to create a new character. So anyway, what I did was I had Curfew Murphy then start working with one of the other players. Um, it was my daughter's character was an elf because my daughter actually really responded to this character. She really liked this character. And so I kind of had her start talking to my daughter's character. And I had Scabs, this guy, start talking to the new thief character that this player had started. And so in all of this is kind of foreshadowing. He's going to play a big role in the game coming up, as is she. And um, I didn't know it at the time. So, uh, you know, when I was going through this, I created these two completely different characters. Um, years later of like real world game time. So this just happened like a few months ago. Um, there was a storyline that came up where this guy got into trouble. He kind of betrays the characters, um, but he does it for a good reason. And you find out it's because these bad guys had kidnapped his baby. And so he was forced to kind of do something against his will for this other group so that they wouldn't hit, hurt his baby. And so he gets into trouble and um, you later find out that this girl curfew murphy is actually his niece and i didn't know that when i started creating these characters it just kind of came up naturally in the story plan but this makes sense it like made sense within the story and so the players were like oh my gosh i had no idea and i was like yeah i kind of didn't either <laughs> but um you know it made sense at the time so anyway um those were those two particular uh, npcs now i also had some you know different people like officials at the um for the keep. So I have the bailiff and the scribe. And so they are always at the gate checking people in. So the scribe records the names of people that are coming into the keep. And then they collect the taxes based on how wealthy that person seems as they're, as they're coming in. Okay. And then the bailiff is almost always there, right? So they were always there. And then at, you know, what I did though, was have things kind of change over time. So like one time the characters go in and I wrote it in my notes here as I was planning for one of my sessions, but uh, the bailiff had two dogs with him and he was very proud of them, Brutus and Cassius. And he starts talking about these dogs and who gave them to him and why he had them. And that was foreshadowing because that relationship that he had with the person that gave him the dogs was going to pay off much later if the characters decided to investigate it. So that's what, I mean, it would happen anyway, but like I was, I was planning a seed to kind of let the characters know, like this is out of, you know, it's not consistent with the way this guy normally acts. And if that was something that they wanted to follow up on, they could have. So, um, but, uh, and then one time or I had him just not even be there at the gate. And that was very kind of suspicious because he was always there. And at the time I just kind of put in that, like, he wasn't there. Partly it was because I was just running out of steam, like trying to role play all these different NPCs that were happening in this particular session. But then later on, I was trying to think of like, what was the reason that he might not have been there? Cause the characters were really interested. They're like, why isn't this guy there? He's always there. And that kind of let me know that like, they're picking up on these clues that like, because this this guy's always there. That must mean something that he's not. And so I was starting to kind of create behind the scenes something that might happen. And that paid off like almost a year later of game time as to why he wasn't there. And so again, it was like a form of uh, foreshadowing. Okay. So uh, I also had guards at the, at the keep. And so I was showing uh, them pictures like this. So the first time that they entered, I just said, you know, I was mostly concentrating on the bailiff and the scribe. And then they said, and I, and I just mentioned, I was like, oh, there's two guards there, like this guy. And of course, the, you know, because I didn't prepare for it, they were like, well, what's up with these guards? Like, what do they look like? What are their names? Like, things like that. And I was like, uh, yeah, sure. So I said, one of them is very young. And um, he looks like he's on high alert, like he's really paying attention. And then the other one's older, a little bit more seasoned. He's overweight. He's a little past his prime. He looks like, um, you know, he's kind of just really disinterested. He's he's just showing up. And I kind of just made that up on the fly. I think I had some notes, or like a table or something written down. I didn't even uh, uh, like roll on it. I just didn't have time. I glanced at it. I saw a couple of words and I just kind of went with it and I moved on. But then 
to myself, as soon as I said that one of the guards was young and looked like he was on high alert, I was originally thinking he's just trying to impress this other guy that he's with. But then I recalled that, and if you saw my video where I talked about introducing a new player to the campaign, that player character, it's a fighter named Greta the Wanderer. And part of her background is that she's wanted for a murder that she didn't commit. And so I said that this guy was, you know, young and on high alert. And then I said, he's paying particular attention to the Greta character as she pays her tax and then goes into the keep. And that was sort of letting that player know like, hey, I didn't forget about this. This is, you know, but you can't forget either. Like your character is on the lam and kind of like needs to take care of like where she goes and who she's talking with and, and you know, trying to kind of play, play it low key. And so that particular guard, then the next time they came through the gate, like they'd left and then they came back through and they immediately were like, is that same guy there? They were very concerned that the same guard might be there. And so I said, yes. And that, and then we gave him a name, uh, Anselm, and he became like a recurring character where, um, that the players eventually trusted. He, he showed them that he trusted them. But again, these are things that like, I didn't necessarily intend to have this guard be like a, you know, a main NPC, but it turned out that way just through the course of role playing with these with those characters and a little bit based on their background. Okay, so I had him. Then I had the guild hall where I had um, guild master Munchberger. Again, this name is coming from Professor Dungeon Master's campaign that he does. They'd already met him before, but the guild hall is like basically the third biggest building in the keep. So I described to them when I was discussing the layout of the keep that the three main buildings are are sort of like the bailey, the inner bailey where like the the castle lives, and then there's the guild hall and then there's like the cathedral to the great church and those are the three biggest buildings in the town that also is a representation of the three main factions in the town so there's sort of this kind of um a little bit of 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 a uh, um some animosity between those three groups because they're vying for power over the hearts and minds of the people the church the commerce guild hall and then the the civic um institutions and that's very common from you know middle ages as well but um this is something that you know my players weren't really used to but they were kind of trying they were starting to see how these different factions were kind of allying against each other and sometimes working together just to kind of depend it okay but you had the guild hall so he that guild master that is one of your sort of like um, contact type of NPCs where he can give out missions and stuff. So that's essentially what he's there for at this point. If they want to work with him, he will assign missions to them. So a couple of things happened with the players talking to this guy so often. And, you know, one of the was, you know, that he again could offer them like, hey, I'm looking for guards to guard my caravan on the way here and there. So and that was a way for them to start hearing about other towns that were around get, getting names of towns because you know, he was traveling in between them. And uh, but, you know, the, another thing that happened was I realized that I was starting to have different PCs speaking to different characters and, and kind of being. So I talked about Curfew Murphy aligning with, you know, uh, first one player and then my daughter's uh, character. And then there was scabs of one of the thieves. And then. Um, so I had I had uh, the guard at the gate and the fighter character, Greta the Wander, and there were three elf characters. So there was my daughter's character. There was her friends. Uh, well, they're all her friends, but um, there were three elf characters. And I was starting to kind of see that they were all always doing things together. And I kind of wanted to help them have a little bit of individuality. So that's one of the reasons why I had the curfew Murphy NPC talk to my daughter's elf. But then I had um, the, the guild master. He ended up talking with one of the other elves uh, um, whose uh, the elf's name was Clara. And the player was a little bit more shy. She was very, she was always like the last one to enter combat. She's always fighting at range. So she was always shooting a bow rather than, um, you know, running in with like a sword or something like that. And, um, you know, she was the only elf that had like the shield spell. So first round of combat, and it, it was a smart thing to do, but like she would always take the first round of combat to back away and cast shield on herself. And so, and she didn't really interact with a lot of NPCs. And so what I did was have, uh, and it was unexpected, I wasn't planning to do this, but I decided to have the guild master get confused and think that she was the leader of their group of adventurers. Um, she's an elf. And so she's long lived, uh, you know, uh, the, the character is. And so I had him just decide that like, she looked like she was the most capable of what was going on. And, you know, it just, th there wasn't necessarily anything she had done that would have made him say that, but I was just trying to kind of draw her out a little bit and let her know that I was including her. And so he started referring to her like, Hey, do you want to ask your, 
your associates if they wanted to take on this mission and things like that. And it just became very clear that he thought of her as sort of being the leader of this group. But then that meant that like she had her own individual NPC that she could talk to. And so every once in a while, like they would come back to town and then all the players would say, like, I want to go talk to whoever it is. And she always wanted to go talk to him which is what I wanted. I wanted to make sure that I was giving all the players equal time to have interactions with NPCs if they wanted to. And, and she did. She ended up taking me up on it and, and, and doing that. So that was that character. So then another one that we had was this guy. So this is um, Vasilov. And this was a character, an NPC that got created out of necessity. So I talked slightly about him before, but two of the players decided that they wanted their characters to have wolf pups. And they learned very, very quickly when they were in the goblin caves that these wolf pups were incapable of doing anything other than getting into trouble and slowing them down. And so they realized that they needed someone to watch after their wolf pups when they were adventuring in the caves and also maybe train them, train them how to do certain things. So as they got older, they would be able to be a little bit more self-sufficient. So I created this NPC to um, provide a service for them. He trains their wolf pups, but he also does provide exposition. So he's kind of like a bard. And so I will have him sing songs when they go into the tavern. He's sitting there. Um, he's a very big personality as well. Um, he's a day drinker. So he's he's always kind of a little, a little sauced. And he's always singing songs. But if the player characters ask me what song he's singing... Every now and then, it, that song name is relevant to what is going on in the adventure. And I don't make them roll perception checks or thing like that to figure out. If they ask, I'll tell them the name of the song and some of the lyrics. And then it's up to them to figure out if that is important and if so, why. And a lot of times they make some really fun connections that I didn't even plan on. So this particular NPC, his kind of unique player that he talked to was Holly Short, the elf. So she was one of the characters that had uh, a wolf pup. And so this is the first guy she always wants to talk to when they come back into town. So I was going through all that. And then I realized like I had a couple of uh, characters left, particularly that player character's dad. He plays the cleric in our group, Bartolo the Seeker. And so I needed to create an NPC for him. Well, Fortunately, there were two already part of this module here. They didn't have names, but um, I, I got the names here. So there's this traveling friar. I talked a little bit about him in one of my previous games, uh, but he's uh, he's traveling through and he's got some uh, acolytes with him that uh, I said basically had taken a vow of silence, but they could, um, you know, they could come along and like cast spells and stuff uh, if the players ever needed them for that. And so they took them up on that and they brought these two guys with them into the caves. These two guys do end up uh, betraying them eventually. But, um, and this guy was supposed to, but I, I changed that at the last minute. And then this is the main church representative at the cathedral of the great church in the keep. And so um, this player character, his, um, cleric character uh, is not part of this great church, which is, you know, think of it as like Catholicism, the Catholic church in the Middle Ages. So he's not part of that. And so he's always an outsider. And uh, so in order to kind of create some fun role playing opportunities for him, I didn't put anybody else from his faith in the keep there. He's the only one that's visiting. And so it, he has written into his character background. Um, I, if you remember, I talk about like I have each character tell me something that they hate, something they love and something that they um, are afraid of. And so uh, he said one of the things that he hates is um, the great church. Church. He just doesn't like them for a variety of reasons. And so he's having to interact with these guys a lot and kind of learn that they're not all who they who he thought that they were. Right. So that was um, the characters for him. And then the other one was the witch. And so this is a character type, the NPC that I took again from Professor Dungeon Master's game. And she is the. Um, you know, sort of mentor that's teaching the three elf characters of magic. So in this version of the game in basic Dungeons and Dragons from 1981, all elf characters, it's elf, elf is a class and they're all uh, multi-classified or magic users. That's just what they are. And so these characters having to learn magic and the witch is training them because she's actually never, you know, I put in my game, she's never trained an elf before and elf magic is different than human magic. And so she is getting as much out of this relationship as they are getting. And, um, so I had uh, them work with the witch and just like in the professor's game, they only ever heard her voice in their mind, kind of this weird echoey voice that sounded like multiple voices talking at once. And um, so if you've ever seen um, some of the uh, 
Star Wars animated cartoons like the Clone Wars cartoon, not the Jendi Tartakovsky one, but the the other one, um, the later version. Uh, there was this group of people called the Night Sisters, and it's the same group that um, eventually Darth Maul's uh, character comes from. So anyway, they had this really weird way of talking where you would hear this voice echo. And so I kind of patterned her voice on that. And I kind of said, this is what it sounds like. And then the last echo of the voice that I always hear is this like gravelly demonic voice that doesn't really sound like the witch at all. But um, that was part of it. And so they had this image in their mind. And then, of course, it was blown when later on they actually met her in person. And she looked like this because they were anticipating old Clyde Cogmull. Clyde Caldwell painting, which I thought was fantastic for this use. And I described this as like looking like her witch's tower. But anyway, um, when they met her, they were expecting, you know, a classic witch, you know, with with like the warty nose and the green skin and all that kind of stuff, like very, very like um, uh, Wizard of Oz style of witch. And so, um, again, that was sort of like a, a little switch for them. But anyway, that that's another like sage type character that's there to help provide information for the characters. So I know I'm talking a lot about NPCs and stuff like that. I'm just trying to give you ideas of how I do it in a game. Hopefully I'll give you some ideas, but also I would love to hear how you approach NPCs in your game and, and uh, put your ideas down in the comments below. I'd love to read them. I always love reading your guys' comments. All right, so then let's talk about some villains. So I had to create some villain NPCs in this, uh, you know, for this particular, you know, just group of sessions that we were coming up on to. And so I ended up um, doing this, this, the orc lair. I knew that they were going to be coming across it. So I've got this picture and I use that for the orc chieftain. And then there were always, uh, there were also some um, bandit leaders that were going to be coming up. And so I got some pictures of them. I had black Angus and then I had <laughs> Red Fergus. So obviously, uh, these both of these names came from Professional Dungeon Master's channel. If you can't tell, he really likes to have fun with his names. Um, so I never called this guy Black Angus. I called him Angus the Black. And the, the you know my players they've never even eaten at a Black Angus, so they didn't even realize a restaurant. The dad player got it, but that's fine. So um, and then I called him Fergus the Red, and it was also funny because one of my best friends, uh, his last name is Ferguson, and so and they all know that guy, so they thought that was funny. So um, anyway, so this I have my map here that I got from Professor Dungeon Master's um, Patreon. I'm not going to show the whole thing because um, you can get on his Patreon for $2 into that map and, and all the other maps that he has. So um, anyway, but I, I knew that the player characters were coming across, you know, getting ready to come back to the keep. And so that's why I I'm talking about all these NPCs because they were coming back to the keep based on what they'd said they wanted to do last time. OK, so I had planned out the session where I kind of thought, OK, everything they told me they wanted to do, they're probably going to be at the keep the whole time. And they're just going to have a bunch of NPC conversations, which is why I spent so much time on the NPCs. And I just got all my notes here ready. And but then I kind of thought, like, you know, what happens if they want to go back to the cave? So I was kind of trying to plan things out so I could be prepared depending on like what they wanted to do. And so I had this guy ready. Now, one of the things that I put when I developed this guy was I said that like he was super attached to his dog. He's got this giant like mutant um, dog that um, that he has by his side. And so I had written that into his character description that he was very, very attached to it, which ended up um, being important later because when they did eventually go into the orc caves, um, they uh, they didn't get as far. So I had all these notes of like what was going to happen when they interacted in different parts and who was there and what they were going to find if they investigated into all of these things. And these this was all foreshadowing stuff. And they missed probably like more than half of it because they were a little ill prepared for the orc caves. They didn't um, make a lot of great tactical decisions. And they also just had some extremely bad luck with their dice rolling. And so what happened was eventually they ended up um, actually, this was the orc chief right here. Sorry, this is the picture. They ended up interacting with the orc chief and uh, and his dog, and they got in this huge fight, and they um, were very low on hit points, and they almost died. And they probably would have when my daughter's character swung a lucky blow, and she ended up killing this guy's dog. And then she felt horrible as as the player. She felt bad because she said, like, "I don't want to kill the dog," but like it was, it would have killed them. And so. Uh, and then the uh, I realized like well this guy he, it was just him and his dog at, at this at this particular juncture he didn't have any guards or anything with them when they caught him and so I had him uh, make a morale check and uh, he failed and then one of the players started to talk to him and I had her roll um, a reaction check and. 
um, she rolled really, really well. And so I ended up having this guy basically say, like, you know, in, in broken common, like, why did you kill my dog? He was really upset about his dog. And so they basically said they were really sorry and they wanted to stop fighting. And so um, they they kind of were able to split and they ran out of there. And so they missed the majority of the orc caves and all the clues that I had in there for them, which, you know, it happens. So as you see here, this is kind of how I plan some of my sessions, which is like a flow chart. So in this particular case, they kind of ended where they um, they had fought this guy and then they were they were they said they were going to run away. They weren't really sure what they were going to do, which I hate that. But that's kind of where we ended. So I knew that they had to get out of the orc lair, but then I wasn't sure what was going to happen. So were they going to, um, you know, there was there's the secret room in the orc lair that leads to the bandit caves, which I had planned uh, back here, but I didn't actually use it then. And, you know, so was that going to happen or were they going to maybe go back to the goblin caves because they were familiar with them at least. They knew things were going wrong there and they could take advantage of that. Or were they going to return to the keep? And so uh, I had them do a supplies check because I do track resources in this game. So what's their water, food and ammunition situation like? What kind of wounds do they have? Anyway, they eventually did decide to go back to the keep. Um, and so I had some stuff planned here for this kidnapping of this particular character. So this is more foreshadowing. So um, I had this character, Rowena, here. She's the daughter of the Castellan. And I decided that she had been, um, she was going to be married. And so I, and then I mentioned like Curfew Murphy started mentioning this like sessions and sessions before that she was a childhood friend, but that this person was going into an arranged marriage with the, um, the Baron that was the enemy of the Castellan actually. And so that was like a big deal because it was going to be cementing this kind of relationship. And it was feeding all back into initial rumors that the players had heard when we first started playing, when they heard about these political rivalries between these like, um, you know, uh, rival barons and this kind of thing. And so this, it was coming up. However, this didn't happen in that session. Okay. So i um, because they didn't do it. So I was prepared for it. They didn't, they didn't take, they didn't do that. Um, then I had stuff planned if they went back to the Goblin Caves, which they did eventually. But what happened was they told me that they wanted to do a Halloween session. So they very specifically said like, hey, you know, it's October again. It was roughly a year after we'd started playing session 11 and they wanted to have this kind of scary halloween themed adventure and so when they had told me that i started like planting the seeds ahead of time as far as like what the weather was like how people were reacting to certain things just how people were acting in general and i started that like a few sessions before knowing that like hopefully we're going to be able to figure things out so that this would align to run it during the um, Halloween time period, which it did. And so I got the idea for doing that. This is called the Tower of the Time Thief. So uh, I have been a judge for the one page dungeon contest for I think it's been 10 years now and just finished my judging for the 2023 contest like just a couple of weeks ago. So those results should be announced soon if they haven't already. And um, but a couple of years ago when I was judging, I was going through and I came across this particular one page dungeon uh, by um Zach Trent says uh, Noah Morris and Adam Nyoff and I loved it so I actually made a note in the margins when I was judging like that I could use this for my daughter's game so it involves like um, you know different weird things of time that um, are kind of creepy uh, there were some creepy monsters and things in here that I really really liked but it was essentially like a haunted house it's not a house but it's whatever and so I decided to put this into my game and slot it into the keep on the borderlands by basically saying like, you know, this is this uh, church bell tower, but let's land near the cemetery. And it's kind of like on the outskirts of the keep. And so I expanded the area of the keep to include this and talked about it. But then I started to, to, you know, describe, you know, again, the weather and how it's like things, it was really still. And then I had an unkindness of ravens, which I just love that phrase. I think it's so awesome. It's, it's the equivalent of a murder of crows, but it's called an unkindness of raven and had them fly overhead. But I had planted the seeds like sessions and sessions before that usually people thought that this was a superstitious bad sign. So the Greta the Wanderer, it was written in her character sheet. She does not like um, ravens, she thinks that they're bad luck. Um, Grunge the dwarf, that was one of their hirelings. Um, when he saw it, he said it was a very, very bad sign. And so these are things that they'd seen time and again that they knew like something's up. So one of the things that happens in this adventure is that there's a room in here where the characters look in this um, mirror and they can see uh, and talk with their lost ancestors. And so I thought, okay, that's a cool idea, but I'm going to creep it up a little bit. So I had all the players email me 
um, you know, a few sessions before we did this. So I was planning ahead so that, you know, I, I didn't want to like make it too obvious what I was doing. And I said, you know, and I'm always asking them to tell me about their characters. Tell me something, you know, like, uh, again, like the fear, hates and loves things or, you know, just whatever it is. And so in this particular case, I said, tell me about an ancestor that your character is, you know, really a, a likes or remembers or, you know, whatever it was. And so they all wrote back with a, a different answer about a particular you know, maybe it was a grandmother or a sister or like whatever it was. Right. And so I had that ready. And then I, again, I creeped it up again and I'll show you that in, in a second. I'm uh, just talking about how I prepared for this. So, um, but then you see my notes here. So I had, again, all the notes on the, on the weather and, and, you know, just kind of general things about what was going on in town. And then I, I mentioned, again, you see here, I mentioned how the bailiff isn't there and the, the, the scribe is very gruff. Like people aren't acting the way that they normally are. And then that guard that kind of, um, kind of attached himself to Greta the Wanderer he mentioned that like they might need their help and like why is that and then the you know the um at the guild hall like the guy is is very gruff and distracted and is very dismissive and then even uh gustav at the, at the um tavern he's talking about like there's this holiday that they call the the purging and when he was a boy he dressed up and that the tradition kind of faded away. Um, but he mentioned that he thought he might've seen one of his ancestors, but he doesn't like to talk about it. And so um, his kids aren't around. That was another big thing. His kids are always helping him, but his kids are away. So something's going on. People aren't really happy. Well, one of the things I'd also foreshadowed in this game, very, going back to the very beginning, was this idea that there had been sort of a falling out between the great church and magic users, and they didn't really get along. And so, um, and you know, that was one of the reasons why the witch just stays in her tower and doesn't come out. And so that kind of, um, you know, again, was some foreshadowing there. Then I had some notes here about Curfew Murphy. And the foreshadowing here is that she pulled aside one of the characters, which is, again, my daughter's character, to ask about the original character that she talked to, that thief character. I know it gets confusing, but um, this is the character, Alex, that the player had decided to retire. And th the player told me that she, Alex ran off to go fight this guy in the caves and, um, uh, they just all assumed that she died because she had told me like, I don't want to use this character anymore. Well, I had decided that she hadn't died and I knew why, but, um, so I had Cora start asking him like, Hey, we've heard about people disappearing in the case, but they're not always dead. So she'd put out contacts, but then she was also worried about her old childhood friend who's engaged to be married because she might not ever see her again. So again, even though this is the Halloween session, I was starting to foreshadow other things that are going to come up later. So uh, then I had, you know, the dwarf uh, guy, I had uh, scabs who approached about, you know, some rumors about an unsavory uh, folk in town, which was foreshadowing for another scenario that I was going to run from the Dungeon Craft YouTube channel. And then uh, again, I had their um, the bard guy, Vasov, was playing the souls of the purge as a ballad and that he could explain what that was if they asked him about it, which they did. And so they got the story that basically there was um you know a, a a point in time where a a splinter group of knights of the great church but they don't really belong to the great church they kind of had gone a little um you know heretical they went down and hunted down all these magic users and basically just massacred them all and so it's become this night where people remember that this happened and um not in a good way that they remember it so um i talked about some superstitions that that uh, vasilov has about like bells ringing and um bells ringing are there to ward spirits away and the thing is the bell tower uh, the bell in this tower is not ringing and so that was a big thing like they he had mentioned this to them before i was just reminding him that vasilov believes that bells ward off evil spirits and then the characters were like well wait a second the bell in the bell tower is not ringing and this guy's like yeah i know and he was kind of scared about it so then what I did, because, you know, this is really hard to read, um, you know, to play during to, like during a session. So I basically took everything and I kind of re put it into my book here, how I normally write things out. I did my smells, sights and sounds so that I knew how to, you know, work with a couple of these different things here when I was describing them. So it's all right there where I needed it. These are reminders of me of how the witch refers to um the three elf characters. So, um, you know, she doesn't call them by their name. She has like these very degrading names for them. Again, I've got an idea I got from Professor Dungeon Master's uh, YouTube channel. But anyway, I had all this kind of stuff in here. So this was fun because it was the first time that the cleric character got a chance to use his turn undead ability. There were some skeletons here. And so that was really cool for them that he was able to do that. Um, and then, okay, so then as far as like that, um, I mentioned that area where there was the mirror that they could look in and see their ancestors. So what happened was when they looked in the mirror, 
they started to see the ancestor like doing an action that they thought. So like one of the characters mentioned how her grandmother's uh, and, you know, she would bake cookies and stuff. And so then I mentioned that like, okay, well you see her baking, but then she's got this really like grisly weird smile on her face. It's really sinister. And as you're looking, you realize that she's baking poisonous cookies to like kill people. And then one of the characters mentioned that her, her, and sister um, like to sew. And so I, I, I wrote in there like, oh, you know, she's sewing, you, that's, this is what you see, you see her sewing, but then you realize that she's sewing something and the material that she's using is some kind of skin. I didn't say human skin, but it, that was the implication was that it was human skin. And um, so they were all different. Like one of the players mentioned um, like having a sister and, you know, and so I mentioned like, you know, this isn't the sister that you thought it was like the way that she's acting. It's really creeping you out. And then um, one of the characters mentioned an ancestor was the cleric character. The dad mentioned that he had this like kind of bigger, larger than life personality um, ancestor. He just like really enjoyed food and liked to eat a lot. And then I mentioned that like one of the reasons that he was so big, he realized was because this guy had eaten his twin brother in the womb before they were born. So all super creepy, grisly stuff, but I tailored it to each player because some of the players, as we've discussed before, they're not really, um, they don't like that level. They wanted to be scared. They told me they want to be scared, but they don't want to be grossed out or, you know, things like that, which I'm fine with. So I tailored each one to the specific player. And then what I did was I printed them out. And so I had it like on little cards and uh, you can see them here and I printed them out and then I handed them to each player and I said, this is just for you. And then if you choose to share it with everybody else, that's on you. But like, you don't have to, you can keep it to yourself, but they loved it. They loved these descriptions. They really liked the idea that I had taken these ancestors that they had kind of talked up in a very positive light. And I had kind of switched it around on them for this Halloween time period adventure. And it really kind of creeped them out. So um, again, just something that you can do to kind of plus this up. So that wasn't even part of this. I just liked the idea of putting it in there. So um, really fun stuff. This is a fun adventure. Again, you can get this in a compilation of a pay, pay what you want for, um, I think it's like 74 adventures. This is from 2021, one page dungeon contest. And again, I'll put a link in the show notes below. So as far as foreshadowing, I talked about that a lot. I talked about how I had some stuff here. It's a fine line between foreshadowing and railroading. So like as, as you know, Curfew Murphy's talking about how Alex might have disappeared in the caves and she might not be dead. She might, you know, something might be going on. She's going to look into it. Well, I had an idea of what was going on and it was going to be related to something that could come later. But the thing is, if the players had never gone to the caves again, if they had just decided like, we're going to pack up and leave town and move on. I wouldn't have made them do that because I don't want to make them do anything. So if they decided that going back to the case wasn't important to them, that wouldn't have happened. However, they did decide to go back to the case. So I had things that could happen while they were there. And they did. They do end up interacting with that character again in the future. And it's it's all explained in a future um, session of like what happened to them. But I, I like to do foreshadowing. I like to have that stuff ready because it pays off later. But sometimes it doesn't pay off because the players just don't take advantage. And that is totally totally fine. So that's a little bit about NPCs and how I develop them, the kind of the concepts that I follow, as well as a little bit about my use of foreshadowing. I didn't get too into the weeds on that. I think you guys kind of get the concept, but the idea is that I try to plant some seeds ahead of time, whether it's through NPC and exposition, or I did talk before about how I will use like the message board. Uh, and again, so a, a lot of these things are ideas that the characters can follow up on as foreshadowing. And it might not come up for six to 10 sessions or, or even more, uh, but when it does, uh, it really kind of pays off and it helps the players kind of feel that the world's really immersive and that they are having a role in what happens there. But also, um, if it doesn't come up, you know, again, that's fine too. Don't force it. Like follow your player's lead. I, I have all these different threads that I've put out there and I connect them kind of behind the scenes to make it seem like I've had this grand story planned the whole time. But a lot of times just parts of it just don't work out because the players aren't interested and I'm following that lead. If they're not interested, I'm not going to force them to do it because they're not going to have fun in that particular case. So then I talked a little bit about, you know, this particular adventure. Um, again, this is the Tower of the Time Thief from the 2021 One Page Dungeon Contest. Um, this was one of the um, one of the winners. So that ended up in the in the. Uh, the top rated uh, adventures from that time. So, uh, and then I have how I adapted it. So if you want my notes um, for, you know, these particular rooms and stuff from this, um, 
feel free to to hit me up. You know, I you would want to get the map and the adventure from from that. I said it's pay what you want, but I can give you my uh, little interpretation here if you want. So send me an email. My email is in the show notes. And uh, or it's on my about page. You can click and, and get my email revealed. Send me an email, and then I would be happy to send the, these uh, you these uh, particular notes that I wrote, so you can use them in your game. So um, I I really hope that you enjoyed this video. I know a lot of you ask all the time, like when are you going to do another campaign update video and, and and your campaign prep? I love those, and so uh, I hope that you uh, enjoy this. And I do hope that you, you know, you guys will stick around and also watch my history videos and vice versa. If you're uh, someone who enjoys my history videos, I really hope that you watch my campaign prep videos because as you see, I'm using a historical module here. It's kind of like my, um, you know, my, my framework for these adventure videos. OK, so coming up next, I will be uh, having another history video. And it's one that a lot of people ask for in my 5000 subscriber giveaway. So if you want to find out what that is, tune in to the next video. Um, and uh, it should be coming out probably next week. So today is uh, October 30th. The next video should be coming out um, the week of November 5th or whatever that week is. So uh, that's it for now. And so I would just, again, like to say thank you so much for watching. Happy gaming. Stay safe. And I'll talk to you next time. Now it's time for the bonus content, what I was drinking, what I was listening to while I was preparing my notes for this particular video. So I was drinking some Amaro. This is Sibona Amaro. My friend brought this uh, back for me from Italy. This is from the Piedmont region. However, I am pretty sure that you can get it here in the United States. So we've talked about Amaro before, or Amari, which is the plural. They're bitter Italian liqueurs. I like to drink them after dinner, um, partly because it helps settle my stomach, but also partly they're lower ABV. So this is only 28% alcohol as opposed to something like a bourbon which is usually around 40 percent and uh it it's bitter so i drink it slower because it's not something you can drink quickly uh, this one has some spices that i associate with this time of year this is fall it's october 30th it's it's later in the fall season um, nights are getting chillier so this is something i can sit and kind of warms me up and i can linger over it it's got flavors of clove and cardamom there's some burnt orange peel um and again, I just, I kind of like it just to kind of like sip on. Mm. I haven't tried to make a cocktail with it yet, but I'm sure I'll get around to it eventually. Okay, what I was listening to, this is a fun story, but I picked this up at Record Store Day in 2017. This is Smokin' in Seattle, live at the penthouse. So this was thought to be um, a lost recording of a, you know, a live recording at the penthouse in, in um Seattle. And this is Wes Montgomery, guitar player with the Winton Kelly Trio. Now, normally the Winton Kelly Trio is Winton Kelly on keys, Paul Chambers on bass, and Jimmy Cobb on drums. However, uh, in this particular case, Ron McClure is on bass. But very, very famous rhythm section in jazz. They played on a ton of records in the 50s and 60s. And then Wes Montgomery was a very, very famous guitar player. Probably my favorite jazz guitar player. His catalog is not huge. Um, but it's just, I really, really like it. I like his style. So uh, anyway, the fun story about this is that I was waiting in line to pick this up uh, for record store day at Amoeba Records in Hollywood before they moved to the old one. And my friend, my best friend and I were there. We're standing in line and we're standing in front of this guy and we're talking about what we're going to pick up. And I happened to mention that I really, really wanted to get this West Montgomery Smoking Seattle record. And it turned out that the guy that we were standing in line in front of was the associate producer of the album, Charlie Puzzo Jr. And if I remember the story correctly, I think it was his dad that actually owned this club in Seattle. And so he has all of these like really amazing recordings of live shows that were done at the penthouse that's just never been released. And he was looking for funding and trying to find people to put them out. Now, slowly, little by little, they're starting to come out. So, um, which is great. It's really awesome that he's doing that. Uh, I just thought it was funny that we, um, we happened to just randomly be standing in line in front of them. Now the story gets even funnier. I'm on social media and I'm sharing all this stuff on my um, on my Twitter account about tabletop role playing games. And somebody follows me and anytime somebody follows me, and this is like years later. So anytime people follow me, I, I look at their profile really quickly to see who it is and, and what they're about. And this particular person said that they were into role playing games and, you know, table, you know Dungeons and Dragons stuff, but also they were into um, jazz and, and vinyl records. And I thought, oh, that's really cool. Like what a random um, you know, mix because you know, other than me, I don't really know anybody who's in that. And so uh, I looked a little deeper in his profile, and um, 
realize that it was this guy. It was, it, I had forgotten his name, but it was Charlie Puzo. And he followed me on Twitter for my D&D content. Um, and so I, I contacted him. I said, hey, this is really funny. I don't know if you remember this, but I stood in line in front of you at Amoeba Records to pick this album up. So then just to bring it full circle even more, he now shops at my best friend, the guy who uh, I was waiting in line for at Amoeba. My friend opened a record store last year in Burbank um, called Run Out Groove Records, and Charlie Puzo shops there all the time. Let's like let's become one of his local shops, and so um, it's just really funny that you know years ago was waiting in line with him, and then you know he follows me for my social media or for D and D content, but uh, he also shops in my friend shop. Anyway, that's it uh, for this particular video. So again, thank you for watching and please go into the comments and let me know what you thought about the video, how you like these, uh, this campaign prep update video and NPCs. And uh, please like and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And then uh, also in the comments below, you'll find places where you can join me on social media, on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, on Blue Sky. You'll also find links to my blogs where I share uh, tabletop role playing game content. And you'll also find a link to my shop where you can buy something to support my channel. So right now, as far as financially, that is the best way you can support my channel, which is to buy a t-shirt, hoodie, mug, poster, anything like that from my shop, from an exclusive design that you can only find at my shop. And then, um, uh, then uh, also you can look out for my next video that's coming up. I talked about that uh, before. It's gonna be one of my um, campaign update videos. Or, I'm sorry, it's gonna be one of my D&D history videos. But in the meantime, if you're looking for more, you can check out one of these videos here. Even if you've already seen it, if you rewatch it, it does help my channel. And so I really appreciate your support. And uh, thanks again for watching. Cheers.